Good evening. Glad you're here on this uh, good, good Friday. As my mother-in-law Barbara noted early this morning, there's not a cloud in the sky. Probably the brightest Good Friday I can remember in a, in a long, long time because uh, some Good Fridays just seem to, uh, to be dark and cloudy and to uh, match more the, the mood of the day. But uh, it's a Good Friday for us. If you did not uh, place your nail that you received on the entrance, on entering the church tonight, you can do that on the way out. Those nails remind us that it's our sins that uh, placed uh, Christ on the cross and the suffering that uh, he uh, endured was for us. Um, by his wounds, we are, are healed. We begin by singing Strick, Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted. The major part of our Good Friday service is the reading, um, responsive reading with parts of the, of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. But first of all, I'm going to uh, continue this series that we've been doing throughout Lent on, uh, on Jonah. And tonight, uh, the answer is the, the title of the sermon. And it comes from Jonah chapter 4, verses 3 through 11. Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what became of the city. Now the Lord appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun arose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? 
This is our reading. My dear friends in Jesus Christ, when the free-thinking 19th century atheist Robert Ingersoll was delivering his lectures against Christ and against the Bible, his oratorical ability usually assured him of a large crowd. He was able to memorize his three-hour speeches, and the people were happy to pay a dollar to listen to him. He was such an eloquent speaker. And one night, after a particularly inflammatory speech in which he severely at attacked a, a man's faith in God, he dramatically took out his watch and he said, this is not part of it. <laughs> I had misplaced my phone earlier and I did not know where it was. <laughs> Now I know. <laughs> Joshua, you're excused. <laughs> Last night Joshua's phone went off. Okay, he took out his watch and he said, I'm going to give God a chance to prove that he exists and that he's almighty. I challenge God to strike me dead in five minutes. And first then there, there was silence. And various people became very uneasy. The tension began to rise so much that uh, some of the people began to get up and, and leave, and one woman even fainted. And at the end of the allotted time, the atheist said, See, there is no God. I am still very much alive. And after the lecture, a young fellow said to a Christian lady, Well, Ingersoll sure proved something tonight, didn't he? And her reply was memorable. Yes, he did, she said. He proved that God isn't taking commands from atheists. How true. God doesn't take orders from anyone, does he? Not from Jonah, either. And this infuriates Jonah to the point that he asks to die. If God's not going to do what he feels is the right thing to do, and that is to destroy the Ninevites, he might as well die. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. And he repeats it again five verses later. You know, any wish for death is self-centered and disregards God. Did you notice how often Jonah refers to himself? Oh, Lord, this is not what I said. Is this not what I said while I was still at home? That's why I was so quick to flee, to run down to Tarshish, to get on that, to run down to Joppa and get on that boat and try to fail, sail to, uh, to Tarshish. Take my life from me because it would be better that I die. Self-centeredness always negates any affirmations and confessions of faith that we make toward God. Jonah's first prayer was in the belly of the big fish. But now that the Ninevites have repented in word and deed, Jonah asks God to die. His prayer now shows that Jonah has again been swallowed up. He's been swallowed up by anger. And between verses 3 and 8, Jonah's desire to die are affirmations of God's provisions for life. Jonah affirms God's mercy and his forgiveness. You are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. God raised up a plant to provide shade for Jonah's quick destruction. For, for, for the, and he, God provided the quick destruction of the, of the plant too. And this all tells us that God is the creator and he's the sustainer of life. And when he wants life to end, human life or the life of a plant, then it's at God's command. Our lives are in his hands. Any wish for death is self-centered and disregards God's will. There may be times when we want to die. With Jonah, we may say, over my dead body, Lord, I don't want to do that. 
I don't want you to be merciful to those people. Jonah's reaction is a reaction against God's graciousness. And though Jonah has himself been spared the death he deserved for his evil, unforgiving heart, he cannot accept that God could possibly extend his grace and his mercy, his gospel, to non-Israelites. To accept that God wants to save the Ninevites, ask Jonah to, to throw out his whole world view in which God was favorably disposed toward, toward Israel, his chosen people, but not toward anybody else. So if God is going to save the likes of the Ninevites, then just pick me up and throw me into the sea because I quit. You see, it's really a question of who owns the gospel, who manages the gospel, who provides the gospel, who delivers the gospel. Jonah would have kept it for himself and for Israel. And when he can't do that, he wants to die rather than share it with others. So much for love your enemies and pray for them. There's no situation where God's grace and mercy and compassion do not apply to you or to me. We cannot say, well, my situation is too dark for God's love to, to penetrate. I've sinned so greatly that there's, there's no way that God could ever possibly forgive me. No one can ever say, I wouldn't even forgive me if I were God. In the end, God's grace and mercy will prevail over Jonah's obsession with himself or any obsession that we might have with ourselves. Even, with, even if we're, we're faced with the fact that our, our sins mean that we deserve to die. And we do, right? The wages of sin is death. But instead of us dying for our sin, Jesus went to the cross, didn't he? And he died the death that we deserve. But we're much like pitiful Jonah if we limit God's grace because we feel that we don't deserve it or others don't deserve it. So God doesn't take orders from Jonah. But he does ask his prophet a question. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? And that's the end. That's the end of the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah ends with a question. But it's God's gotcha question. For Jonah. The Lord is not only posing the question to Jonah back then, He's also directing that question to us right now. Shall I have compassion upon that great city of Nineveh? Is our answer lukewarm? Well, maybe. So, what does the Lord do? He sends the answer. In Matthew chapter 12, the Pharisees demanded that Jesus, to prove that he's a Messiah, would perform a, a miracle. And his answer was to say, not, not to do the miracle, but to, to say this. A wicked and adulterous generation asked for a miraculous sign. No sign will be given except the sign of Jonah. For as the prophet Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish... So the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment of this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now one greater than Jonah is here. That's really where the story begins. Compassion for Ninevites. was characteristic of Jesus' ministry. 
He talked publicly with women and lepers. He socialized with sinners and tax collectors. He exercised demons. He healed the lame. He gave sight to the blind. In Matthew 9, Jesus describes these with, with these words. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion. Compassion. The Greek word there is splognizomai. And it has to do with the, the gut, the spleen. In other words, Jesus had a heart for people. Because, Matthew says, they were helpless. Harassed like sheep without a shepherd. And he called his disciples to him and said... I have compassion for these people. And again, filled with compassion, he reached out his hand and he touched the leper. But the Savior's most shocking compassion was even before the creation of the world when, when he arranged the birth of Judas, when he made the iron for nails, when he planted trees for the wood of the cross, when he orchestrated the events that brought Pontius Pilate to Judea and Caiaphas, the high priest, to Jerusalem, and, and when he orchestrated events where the crowds would cry out, crucify him, crucify him. Shall the Lord have compassion on that great city, Nineveh? We don't know what, what answer Jonah gave. But whatever it was, and whatever answer we give now, Jesus proclaims God's final, definitive answer. Because with his whole heart, and with his blood, with outstretched arms, he says, yes, I am the Father's answer. I say yes to compassion for sinners, and, and yes to love. I say yes to full forgiveness for every sin that's been committed. Yes, as Paul wrote, all God's, the answer to all God's questions are yes in Jesus Christ. So this is Good Friday. And on this day, God shows us that indeed he has worked everything together for the good of those who love him. On Good Friday, we learn that because of God's mercy and Jesus' compassion, we survive the folly of our sin. Amen. We sing the Lamb.
A reading from Hebrews chapter 4. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. This is the word of the Lord. We bow our heads in prayer. O Father of compassion and mercy, we come before you on the anniversary of Christ's death to thank you for being gracious to us sinners in our lost condition, just as you were gracious to the Ninevites. In your love, you delivered delivered up your Son to the cross for us all, because it pleased you to permit him to suffer and die instead of us. We have full pardon for our sins and are released from all punishment. We do not need to wonder, as did the Ninevites, whether or not you would have mercy on them. We know you did have mercy on all mankind when Christ suffered and died for us on the cross. And as a result, we enjoy peace with you, our Heavenly Father. Lord Jesus, when you breathed your last breath, you tried triumphantly, it is finished. Your redeeming work of saving us from our sins came to an end. Our mortal tongues can never express all the praise due to you for all that you suffered for us. Oh, what joy, what comfort, what hope is ours in the minds when it comes to sin and every trouble, knowing that our sins are forgiven and that we are redeemed from Satan and eternal death. May our hearts never stray from you, and may we never think that our sins have put us outside this redemption. As long as we live, shower us with your grace of body, mind, and soul. O Holy Spirit, whose life-giving power has awakened us from spiritual death and given us faith in our crucified and risen Savior, Grant that dying to sin in repentance, we might in faith toward him also rise up to new life every day, thus living the baptized life as a child of God. With the peace of Christ in our hearts, O Holy Spirit, give us strength to bear our crosses to the glory of Jesus' name. Through the word and the sacraments, keep us in true faith, and move us to share the good news of Christ's victory over sin and death with others, those who may have lost the faith, and with others who have yet to know him as a source of everlasting life and salvation, that they may join us in bending our knees to the glory of Jesus' name, the only name under heaven and on earth through which we must be saved. To you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is all power and glory forever and ever, Amen. We sing, Go to Dark Gethsemane.
The Passion of Our Lord According to St. John, the 18th and 19th chapters. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with him. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those who me, I have lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that my father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient for one man to die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter stood outside the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal, a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I have said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, so they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. The next reading is from Isaiah 52 and 53. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. For that which has not been told, told them they see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? 
For he grew up before him like a young plant. And like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. And no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could not eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? If this man was not doing evil, he would not have delivered him over to you. Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Do you say this of your own accord or did others say it to you about me? Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. So you are a king? You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. What is the truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, Hail King, King of the, the Jews. Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Behold the man. 
When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. We have a law, and according to that law, we are denied because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you, been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement, and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king! Oh, away with him! Away with him. Crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to be crucified. So they took Jesus and he went out, bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Please rise, face the cross, and as we, as we adore the cross, we're really contemplating the severity of our Savior's suffering for us, his wounds, and the cost of, of our redemption. Behold the life-giving cross on which was hung the salvation of the whole world. Oh, come, come let, let us worship, worship him. him. Behold the life-giving cross on which was hung the salvation of the whole world. 
Oh, oh come, let us worship him. Behold the life-giving cross on which was hung the salvation of the whole world. Come, let us worship him. You may be seated. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. And so the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write. What I have written, I have written. Thus says the Lord, What have I done to you, O my people? And wherein have I offended you? Answer me. Though I have raised you up out of the prison house of sin and death, you have delivered up your Redeemer to be scourged. Though I have redeemed you from the house of bondage, you have nailed your Savior to the cross. O oh, my people, holy, holy Lord God, God holy, holy, and God. holy and most merciful Redeemer, God eternal, leave us not to bitter death. O oh, Lord, have mercy. Thus says the Lord, What have I done to you, O my people, and wherein have I offended you? Answer me. Though I have conquered all your foes, you have given me over and delivered me to those who persecute me. Though I have fed you with my word and refreshed you with living water, you have given me gall and vinegar to drink, O my people. Holy, Holy Lord, Lord God, God. Holy, Holy and mighty God. God. Holy and most merciful Redeemer, God eternal, allow us not to lose hope in the face of death and hell. O Lord, have mercy. Thus says the Lord, What have I done to you, O my people? And wherein have I offended you? Answer me. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? My people... Is this how you thank your God, O oh, my people? Holy, holy Lord God, holy and mighty God, holy and most merciful Redeemer, God eternal, keep us steadfast in the true faith, O oh, Lord, have mercy. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier, also his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, 
This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? All who see me mock me. They make me mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. I can count all my bones. They divide my garments among them. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now fulfilled, said to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it up to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was a day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken, and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first, and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus, and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the, the Jewish day of preparation, 
since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before his shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they, and they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, graciously behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and delivered into the hands of sinful men to suffer death upon the cross. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 